I'm uh, coming along to um, <coughs> the Amershed, which is um, a museum in um, in Bristol, and uh, the Radical History uh, Radical History Group are holding some talks there. So, um, so that's what we're going to uh, today. Master, for want of a better word, um, Pinney, John Pinney, and um, the bridge is named in his honour. Um, the reason that bridge was named that way was because in 1996 they had the Festival of the Sea, and there was very scant regard to Bristol's history regarding the African trade. And as a consequence of that, this bridge, it didn't have a name named in Perro's honour. Some people say this was a sop and um, you can judge yourselves whether that is the case or not. Um, he was so pleased he, he sold the contents of the cargo and everything and used some of the money to um, to give succour to sailors from Bristol and his own country. And there have been bad events on the front and there was a quad line all this but again, as we evolve this little talk, um, we'll come across places and themes that, that echo that. The Merchant Ventures are renowned because for 40 years, 40 years they, um, they mounted a campaign petitioning London um, to break its monopoly on the African trade. The Royal African Company that had been set up by various Stuart Kings had the monopoly. Edward Colston was one of their prominent members for over a decade, um, which is where he got a lot of his dogs from. Um, they had the monopoly right up until 1698, and then after 40 years of petitioning, outports like Bristol and Liverpool were allowed to be uh, involved in the African trade. Big shame for us, to be honest. Um, there is a coat of arms, 1699, commensurate with the, the date that they got involved in that. Green Square was laid out exactly the same time as Bristol merchants were prospering from their involvement in the African trade into the 1700s. That's when the square was laid out. It was formerly a marsh. You had the Avon going around there. You had the Froome going down through there. By virtue of rerouting the Froome there, it began to drain the marsh. And then these buildings were set up. The second largest square in Europe. We're always second at some of us. We're going to go to the 1830s with a momentous time for this particular square. October, the end of October 1831. Mills is an expert on this. This was when we had the reform riots there, three days of, of, uh, of butchery and murder and goodness knows what. What was happening in Bristol from the late 18th century, they've been really, people have been really unhappy about their electoral, electoral reform not happening. We were fighting for years to get electoral reform. They also were fighting against the slave trade. They, wanted, they had managed to ban the trade in 1807 but they wanted full emancipation, this still wasn't happening, and they were also really anxious about corporate corporation reform, because this city was absolutely corrupt to its core. Um, in, in the uh, early 18th century, a writer, Daniel Defoe, who was familiar with the whole of Britain, said corporation tyranny was as bad here as it was anywhere else. And 1831's a good day. Everything seemed to culminate in the dissatisfaction of the people, and in 1832, you had the first electoral reform, which enabled 5% of the male population to get a vote. Um, you also then had emancipation, 1833, 1834, of the 800,000 enslaved African people 
in the in the Caribbean and so forth. And then you had in 1835 you had corporation reform as well. All these things, Bristol merchants, some of the pro-slavery lobby like Thomas Daniel tried tried to dip out on. Um, it's unusual in a name in a square named after a queen to get a sculpture of a king in there. And you ever wondered why that was? Well, King Billy, even though Bristol people were unhappy with King Billy because when he came home from the, uh, the Battle of the Boyne through Bristol, he never stayed in the city. He did grant the city access to the African trade, and that is one of the prime reasons he is here. Uh, 1734, 1735, and unusually for a sculpture, he is made out of brass. Brass being one of the major products of Bristol that helped perpetuate Bristol into the Premier League of, of uh, dealing with Africa, which is what the African traders wanted, brass products and so forth, and Bristol became a, that was one of its specialist skills, developed there right the way up the Avon Valley to Bath and so forth, and brass mills at Salford are still in existence. In the olden days it was easier, even though the Severn was really treacherous, to bring goods in by boat rather than across land where the roads were terrible, a bit like today I suppose. <laughs> And um, there's a couple of characters in our history that came from this, this, this area that are, are little known. Uh, one is a, a woman called Frances, who was a Blackymore maid, as she was described in those days. And she was one of the early Baptists. Bristol was a hotbed of nonconformism. Um, Frances went on to become a major mover in the Baptist movement, the, the nascent Baptist movement, in the 1650s, 1660s. In 1647, she went with Dorothy Hazard, another ah. um, person from Bristol who, who needs their place in the sun, if you like. They went to the Putney debates, and the Putney debates were set up in order to uh, try and find what Britain's role going forward would be after the English Revolution or English Civil War, whichever you'd like to call it. Um, it was conducted by a fellow called Rainsborough, whose father had been involved in suppressing the Barbary pirates, these people who were taking Europeans and put them in enslavement in, in, um, in the Middle East. He was responsible for some of that, and he was railing against not only the Barbary pirates, but also the African trade, and also the use of indentured servants from Britain going out as well to the new colonies in the Caribbean. Um, just briefly mentioning these indentured servants, they didn't have a lifetime and their, their, their children didn't have a, a further lifetime of enslavement, but they were basically slaves for a four, five, six, eight, ten years of their servitude, if you like. Um, of the 200,000 that are recorded indentured servants going from Britain and Ireland in the 17th century. Only 40% ever came home. 40% died, 20% um, went on to become pirates, privateers, or running the plantations themselves. And on the right, I belong to a fellow called Sydney Matisse. You then took people from the African coast to the Caribbean and then you put them in the Caribbean. So you put them in the Caribbean. So you put them in the Caribbean. Right then everybody. Um, I, well, I will tell you a little bit. I came to the Radicals because I was a bit of a pub historian and I knew a little bit about the Seven Stars and its relationship with the um, with, with Thomas Clarkson, and it was this little plaque up here that, uh, that sort of Hello. propelled my interest, if you like. I thought, what's so relevant about that? And then I started looking into that Thomas Clarkson, and I found out that he was really a major mover in the abolition of the slave trade. Um, Can I ring you back inside? He was a tall chap. Um, his father had, had died quite young, but he still managed to get into Cambridge University. And his lecturer at Cambridge was really against the slave trade. And um, I don't think he agrees with you, Mark. <laughs> 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 the centre in the ranks.
It doesn't take much to put me off. <laughs> <laughs> We'll get back to Clarkson, yeah. So he, he went, went into Cambridge University, his lecturer set him and his classmates a question of asking about, is it justifiable to enslave somebody else and, uh, and, um, and put them into slavery? And uh, he answered that, he, he won the competition, that was in 1785. Um, it was published as a pamphlet in Latin, and it came to the attention of the fledgling Abolition Society in London, who met at a print office in the city, and um, at one of these meetings, they they had tried several times to put things before Parliament, and they just got dismissed through lack of evidence. As I said, initially he was accepted by the merchants; they talked to him a little bit, but as they got to know of his of his uh, mission, they they clammed up, and then they um, oh, blame me. someone might be coming out any moment now. They clammed up, and then his life. Um, began to get a little bit threatened. You can imagine he, all these vested interests with loads and loads of money. But whilst he was here, he befriended the Quakers in Bristol. They introduced him to the landlord of this pub, Landlord Thompson. Uh, landlord Thompson was then able to show him um, sailors who'd actually been in on the trade um, and, and talk about their experiences. He was able to take him to places like Mars Street, which is just behind where the merchant's main place was in King Street. Um, where they, they used to get people drunk or crack them over the head or whatever, put them in debt and then put them on the, on, the, on the slave vessels against their will because people did not want to go on the, on the, in the tree, enter into the tree. Really, by this, this bridge here, um, the, the lowest possible point to come to cross the Avon. Bristol was known in the 11th century as the stepmother of all England. Because what, what was happening was people from here and the surrounding area were being shipped off to Dublin um, as slaves. And they were then being resold in Dublin to the other parts of the Viking Empire, the Viking Zone. And um, it was a real um, Marks that had gone on for about 400 years until a fellow called St. Wollstone came to Bristol to get it banned. Um, they say that if St. Patrick, well, the patron saint of Ireland, if he was a North Somerset man, that some people believe he was shipped off through Bristol. Bristol wasn't the only centre for this, Chester was another for taking people across the Irish Sea. Wollstone was uh, the last Anglo Saxon bishop. He, um, he became a friend of William the Conqueror's and then his son William Rufus. And when he was um, commanded to do the Doomsday Book of, um, for this part of the world, he found slave pens on the River Froom here with people incarcerated waiting for their shipment off. And it, it, there was a, a, quite a moving piece about young girls with their long blonde hair being tied up and being made with child to enhance the value of their cargoes going across the old car Bristol. Um, we're going over here down to Sir John Hawkins Lane. That's where Sir John Hawkins actually had his brewery. And then we're going to cross into Castle Park where Colston had a, a sugar refinery. Uh, Colston was born here. Um, not, not here, here. But <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> very out. No, 1790 you can see out there. He was born a lot earlier than that, 16... Something like that. But he was born in, in Temple Street, which is just down the way. The house is long gone. Um, it's all blitzed, really, or, or redeveloped like this, this has been. Well, that's That is the number one building, and it's one of the finest, if you look at Pevsner, one of the finest of all 18th century buildings. This used to be two pubs, the White Lion and the White Hart. And um, in the 1850s, they got taken down, but they were the preeminent place for the for the, the Whigs and the Tories to all meet at. Um, one of the places in one of the clubs in there was the <coughs> you had the White Lion Club or the Steadfast Club. They were the Tory ones, and they were read, led by a fellow called Thomas Daniel from about 1760 till his death, no, 1780 perhaps, until his death. 
in the 1850s. Thomas Daniel got more compensation money than anyone else in Bristol from, from um, emancipation in the 1830s. He had extensive operations in Barbados. He was actually born in Barbados, but he became the king of Bristol um, with his political machinations and everything. If you remember, well, it's hard to believe, but you know, you get big assemblies of people, you get, you get people espousing different views and everything. Well, in those days, it was even worse. You get bludgeon boys going around. It's, if they heard of someone coming up to give a talk outside of here, they brought up a brass band to, 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 to make a noise to, to quell them. <coughs> Alright everybody, we're, we're actually going to finish, finish the, the walking talk here. I'm going to talk about him now, but I'm going to finish with some anti-slavery campaigners who are a lot more savoury. This was um, erected in six, uh, seven, uh, 1895, and um, oh yeah, it says that. Uh, and it was sort of the culmination of the cult of Colston that had gone on throughout the latter part of the 19th century. <clears throat> it wasn't a popular choice. They had a lot of a lot of trouble getting the money up for this, and in the end, we, we believe it was a fellow called Arrowsmith who ran a big printing press finally stumped up the money. Um, all throughout time, the, the Colston societies weren't really running on the money from Colston, they were running on the money they raised themselves, and they just happened to be doing it in the name of Colston. The Grateful Society, part of Colston's um, tributes, if you like, were actually the poor buggers who went to his school. With that stuff, well, I will finish with the a little while ago, they tried to get another plaque put on this, not an unofficial one, but an official one, to try and redress the jingoistic balance that is on there currently, just to say, in fact, where he did get his money from. But there's been a dispute over it, so it's been quietly crossed for now. Um, a body called the Merchant Ventures came along and sort of put their wheel on this alternative back, and Mayor Morden kicked against it and they were really, really prominent anti-slavery campaigners. When the great Frederick Douglass came to Bristol, he was hosted by the Eslins and the Carpenters. Mary Carpenter, as well, was in on the act. People in Bristol used to produce goods for the Boston Bazaar in the 1830s, sorry, 1840s, 1850s, and that was to get funds for the anti-slavery campaigns in the States. All, all manner of Bristol people chipped into these, making their own goods. A schoolgirl from Kingswood, poor market workers from, from the, the centre of town, all chipped in with things, and you can't find any record of that. These people are actually doing things in order to try and help someone else's lot. Mary Eslin went on to be a force in the women's movement. Mary Carpenter, um, she was disgusted with the fugitive slave it was introduced in the States in 1851. She had hitherto held up the States as a paragon of liberty and freedom. But as soon as they did the fugitive slave rule, slave rule, which meant that enslaved people who had gone to freedom in other parts of the States were then entitled to be nicked and brought back into the, into the, into the South. She was so disgusted, she let her um, anti-slavery activities slip. Come the Civil War, just after the Civil War, she toured the States. She'd already been to India, quite a girl in the 19th century, I would say. It's pretty hard to go anywhere these days, but she'd gone to all these places. She was in the States. She said anti-slavery was her biggest thing closest to her heart. She met William Lloyd Garrison again. She met Frederick Douglass in Washington. And uh, she was really excited to come back to Bristol and post garrison when he was going to come back to, to Bristol, um, but unfortunately um, she, she died just as soon as she wrote the letter, so he, he didn't ever come back. Sam Blackwell, he was a great pal of Garrison's, he always had Garrison's Liberator magazine on display in his house, which was a really dangerous thing to do in 1830s America, um, but he didn't care. The Liberator was close to his heart, and um, the Eslins as well were great Garrisonians, spreading the word 
splitting from the British in colonial um, anti-slavery society and, and so on, going off on their own in order to, to promote anti-slavery activities throughout the world. Anyway, I'm going to finish there because that's quite a good point, I think, to finish. And um, we've all got to go back and enjoy the M Shed now. So uh, thank you very much for listening to me. questions so we're not going to answer any now. <laughs> we have to be safe going back across the, the, um, the centre. Hello yeah, guys, I, um, I uh, <clears throat> just went on a brilliant um, uh, talk, walk around the city about um, Bristol's um, history of slavery and not just slavery, what ordinary Bristolians did to oppose slavery. It was really, really interesting. Um, uh, taught by Mark Steeds, um, who's in with the um, Radical History Group in Bristol. So, um, yeah, anyway, so I'll, um, I'll edit it all and then put it on after this. Alright, see you in a bit.